God. Let's go to the book of Ephesians. Book of Ephesians. Man, from start to finish, brothers, you guys have you have blessed. You have blessed us. You have blessed us. Shadea, please make sure you're keeping note of time every 25. Thank you. All right, let's mark it. 23 seconds, 23 minutes and counting. Amen. This is, this is not scripture, but it certainly sounds appropriate today. Cleanliness is next to godliness. Right? So we can say we were holy in our service to God. Amen. Cleanliness is next to godliness. All right. So we'll be reading from Ephesians. Thank you, uh, Tia, for supporting us in the rear end, Daniel, as we're engaging in Ephesians chapter 4. We'll read verses 1 through 3. Verses 1 through 3. And I'm going to read from the New King James Version, which states, I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness and long-suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of of peace. Amen. You may be seated. So as we're reading from Ephesians chapter 4 verses 1 through 3, we'll be sharing from the topic today, walking in unity. Walking in unity. Walking in unity. With all of Earth's stresses, frustrations, and questions, one prevailing thought that resounds from heaven to Earth is that heaven is not in a panic. That heaven is not anxious, and that heaven is not in turmoil. There is no convention or consensus or meeting or strategy that is being planned in this moment to address the world's epidemic. Heaven is not on the back end of what is happening and trying to identify a plan and a process to address what is occurring in our present time. What is occurring now has already been addressed before the foundation of the earth. What takes us by surprise, what sideswipes us, what emerges from blind spots in our life did not catch heaven off guard. God is very clear about what is going to happen the results have already been determined. His response has already been given. And the earth is seeking and searching for man-made strategies. We are relying on imperfect people to set the course of our direction, to give us some type of consolation and comfort, and to set our souls at ease. There is a clamor and a pull and a reaching out of towards leadership to be able to speak something into our life that is absent in our own soul. We are relying on our current president of our nation. <laughs> to say something that will calm fears. There is a global 
attention, extended, and eyes and lights are finding itself gearing towards the direction of the United States. They are looking to take their cues from our leadership in our response, in our receptivity, and what we will do moving forward. Externally, there is an impatience of what will be said. Internally, there is turmoil and frustration and anxiety building. What will he say internally and externally? Waiting for something to come from the prestigious seat. Now let's just make it clear. No matter who sits in the seat, our culture and our world has found itself dependent on someone else to give us direction. We have become conditioned, reliant, and putting our trust and our confidence in another human being. But in the most methodical way and strategic way that God would say through Paul in his writings in the book of Romans chapter 13 that all leadership that exists is set by God. Now at the risk of rolling eyes, and sucking and gnashing of teeth. I would challenge us to embrace scripture, Romans 13, 1, that our current leadership is set by God. It's not your choice. May not have been your pick at the ballot, but the current leadership Regardless of character, regardless of personality, regardless of politics, is the set man for this season over our nation. God does all things well. Our culture over the past 400 years prided itself as being one nation, verbally. Actuality, divided. Prided itself, being under submission to God. Verbally, actuality, no. Prided itself, of being indivisible with liberty and justice for what? And though our nation has prided itself in word, it was counterintuitive indeed. Contradictory in its actions and never found itself consistent with what it professed out of its mouth. And as every decade emerged, it found itself moving away from the biblical principles by which it said it founded its nation on. And though we are one nation under God, we will create laws that will prohibit you from publicly praying to this one God. And with all of the decisions that have been made by leaders, the decisions have moved us further and further and further away from God. And in God's strategic way and strategic planning has positioned his universal church that when you do not find solace and strong leadership, that emerges from an elected seat, at least you will find it in the presence of my people.
from slavery. We found our peace in the most difficult of situations, in the gathering with one another. Whether it was in the backside of a barn, learning how to pray with broken English, or ducking down in the tobacco fields of southern states, saying quick prayers that God would shine and give mercy to our people. Or whether it was in the cool of the evening as the sun is going down, gathering by the riverside, being able to sing with one another in spite of all the atrocities and watching family members being taken off the plantation or other people being whipped on the same plantation that you are, being able to gather in the only hope that we have in all of these atrocities, in all of this devastation, all we have is God. And somehow, that was enough. And when that period ended, moving into the post-era of slavery, through Reconstruction, the gathering of churches, we found our strength in the face of racism, murder, lynching, rape, yeah. false imprisonment. Yeah. We found our refuge. Yeah in the house of the Lord. And though now the newer generation has no respect for church, feels that it is not necessary, it is the one institution that we were able to go and learn our alphabets. It was the one place we were able to go and learn how to read, learn how to do arithmetic. We were able to learn and to discuss politics as well as learn about the reality, the grace, and the mercy of a loving God. It was at church where we found our friends. It was at church that we found strategies of how to navigate through this world in all of its epidemics, in all of its uh, racism, in all of its uh, uh, infighting, and all the things that have occurred to our people. We found everything that we need in a gathering with one another. Of which now the new generation that lives underneath us, it ain't necessary. It's not important. If it was not for the emerging of small clusters of believers assembling together across plantations and then starting churches from Philadelphia all throughout the world after post-slavery, we would not have made it to a civil rights movement. Because whenever the Klan wanted to come after blacks, where would they find us most of the time in the evening? At church. How were we able to be so resilient when I can't even walk up to a water fountain that says whites? I have to go to the back of a grocery store to get food, leftover rotten apples, rotten salad, food that has been picked over, spoiled meat. How were we able to move forward? We had the church. Epidemics ain't new to our people. Hard times and challenges. Talking about being in isolation? We're used to being put out of places. Social distancing? We were not allowed to sit in the front of the bus even if there were seats available. We all had to stand 20, 32 people on the back of a bus where there's 15 empty seats from the middle to the front. Being quarantined ain't new for our race. We've been ostracized before. But somehow we were able to gather ourselves together in one place at one time, being in one accord, lifting up one Christ before one God. Something happened that gave us strength to make it from one day to the next. Somebody ought to say amen. And with all of the things that have attacked us as a people, 
one thing that kept ringing from the pulpit across South Carolina, from Alabama to Louisiana to Arizona, through Texas, up to Oklahoma, through Missouri, all the way to West Virginia, all the way up to New, Ma New Mexico, all the way to New, Ma New Hampshire, all the way to New York, to Chicago, to Wyoming. One thing that rang clear every single time they gathered, that we all have to be unified. I can't control what is happening out there, but we can control what we do in here. They may not give our babies the opportunity to have the best books. We may not have the best resources, but our reliance is not on a system that is of this world and people who are ungodly. We will find everything that we need right here in the body of Christ. And I'm talking about people at the time who ain't even had air conditioning in their churches. They had no organ, had no drums. Their drum machine was the heel of the bottom of a, a big old boot or the, that a woman, that old mother used to have in a tambourine. And they would do just like this. That's all the kind of drums you need right there. That's it. That's all, that's all you got. And now they didn't have a praise team. Everybody that showed up was in a choir. And we sung under one voice. With one mind and one purpose. And that deacon that got that bum leg, just like I do, got to stand all up front and say, I believe that God will help us every time. And everybody just begin to clap it. And they start reminding themselves that God is with me. Hard times are not new to us. But what has caused us to persevere in every decade that lied before us is the body of Christ. And though it is the most underappreciated institution that governs the earth, it has and it will always be the greatest. Because when Christ returns, and he's coming. He's not coming back for for profits. He ain't coming back for nonprofit organizations. He's not coming back for charitable organizations. He's coming back for a church without a spot or wrinkle. And for that, I am proud to know I am a part of God's family. He ain't coming back for brick and mortar. He's coming back for people. And so we shift, as we have been talking over the past month, the mindset is to shift our mentality that the church is a place that I show up to. I am the church. And wherever we gather, we're going to have worship. This facility is identified as a sanctuary. But we're the church. We're the church. And if anything great will emerge from these moments that are in front of us right now, it will happen because the church has stepped up as the salt of the earth, and the light of the world. We are at our greatest hour. We are at our greatest hour. How strategic it is. Now for individuals who questioned whether or not there was a God, they're seeking now. People who were casual acquaintances with God are praying to him now. There has been an overwhelming increase of prayers that have been submitted to heaven over the past three weeks. Churches across the United States have been flooded online with receiving prayer requests. Who would have thought? Our prayer conference line on Thursday nights 
there was an increase by 2% on this past Thursday. God does all things well. Hmm. And when you look at the pattern of God in the Old Testament, whenever the people drifted away from God, he allows judgment to occur to redirect their paths back to him. Every single time. Here's the hard part. We want to wait until something happens for us to seek him. When our responsibility and our job every time we gather is to remind you, you don't have to wait, you can pursue him now. But there's some people by nature, by makeup, by personality, and self-centeredness says, I'll wait until the very last hour or minute or second before I pursue him or identify or discover the reality of who he is. Now, everybody at some point will come to a place where they have to confront the reality of whether or not he exists or don't exist. We want to be able to prepare them before they get to that point. That's what we want to avoid. I don't want people to experience calamity, tragedy, and sadness before they redirect their hearts. By nature, why do we have to wait for something bad for us to say, God, I need you? Why does stuff have to fall apart before you love on him? Why do things have to get extremely bad for you to pursue him? When I can pursue him right now. And God in his strategic ways is allowing, not orchestrating, but allowing things to occur. There are more people now coming to Christ than it was in 2019. Now the hard part is, some are coming to him because of fear, not because they want him. Some want rescue, not relationship. And even in this season, as we extend ourselves to be givers and to bless and to take care of those who are around us, people will come in our space, not because they want relationship with us, but I need a rescue. Hey, I ain't been working for a little bit. You think you can help me out a little bit until, you know, until we get back on, until this stuff pass? Yeah, like, I don't know, you know, I don't know what's going on, what this going to pan out, what they going to, you know, they told us we're going to have to freeze our pay and stuff. I don't know what that's going to look like, you know. I mean, we got, we got stuff in the house, but I don't know if it's enough to last us till, you know, September. <laughs> Hear me. It's, it's coming. It's coming. Prepare yourself to get phone calls you ain't had in a long time. I have in the past seven days, I have had a lot of people call me pastor now. I would reckon when this virus is gone, we about to blow up. <laughs> I, have the, I have the church I pastor here on Old Alex Ferry, then I got a church that I pastor on Facebook, then I got one that is exclusive to text messaging. Hear me, hear me, hear me. But this is our greatest hour to be able to be the hands and the feet of a loving God. And while the world is panicking and in an uproar and concerned, this is our moment to calm every fear that exists. And just as Pam says, this will not dictate my life. And as Channon had read and shared earlier, for God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. Or another version says self-discipline. 
if God don't give us the spirit of fear, who did it come from? We know its source. Being fearful is not God's plan. That even in the midst of something happening, he doesn't want me to have fear. Wisdom, yes. Fear, nah. Nah. So this is the moment for us to step up as one. As one family. Not disjointed acquaintances. But functioning as one family under God. Not disjointed acquaintances, but as one family under God. And if we function as one family, unified, together, we can accomplish anything that comes our way. If we make a commitment today, today, not even counting the ones who could not make it today for various reasons, but if we that's in this room today, commit today to say what? No matter what comes our way, as Galatians would say, do good to all men, especially to those who are in the household of faith. We will, we will ensure that every person that is, in, that is in this space right here, you will have what you need. You will not go without and there will not be a care and concern. You will not miss a meal. You will not miss a beverage. You will have water. Water to drink, water to bathe, and water to play in if you want. It will not be a concern for this body. It will not be a concern for you. It's not going to be a concern for you. It is not going to be a concern for you. Now, you might not get crabs and shrimp. Now, I'll eat that and look at this. Does it look like I'm hungry? Positively, no. Huh? But you will be, you will be insured, little Debbies, oatmeal cream pies, nutty buddies, ho hos, Swiss cake rolls, honey buns. You will, in, you will receive Dorito. You will, you will receive from the Most High. Huh? <laughs> oh, milk cream pie. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, indeed. But, uh, but, in, but, in all, but in all seriousness, in all seriousness, if our aim is to follow the pattern and the blueprint left by the first century church, if we follow the framework, we will have what we need. And every home will be blessed. And this enables us to be a light to the world. And although many of us in this room today are extremely confident that things will pan out and things will be well, there is someone right now that is filled with anxiety. Not just about the epidemic, but the blowback in terms of work, in terms of finances, in terms of their tomorrow. Some people are concerned now. Little small things. They're shutting down our daycare. What do I do? I'm considered essential at my job. I need to go. But I don't have nobody to watch my kid because the one that I would have trusted is shut down. So there are so many things that are emerging in the lives of people that I can't take a casual approach anymore to say, you know, well, I'm just going to pray for you today. Our response is, what can I do? That's good. Pray. But follow it up with, I'm going to pray for you and tell me what I can do. I'm going to pray. Yes, I'll do that. But tell me also what I can do. That needs to be my response. What can I do? Right? Ma Darlene, every time I text you, what I'm asking you? When I text you, what am I asking you every time I text you? What can I do? What can I do? Right. Right? What can, I, what can I do? We're asking, what can we do? But it requires a positioning of us being unified and not disjointed. We have to operate as one voice and one people so that the people can see God in reality 
working through us. Now, by some estimation of people, this is the worst thing that can happen to civilization. But I would challenge that by saying, what may be appeared to be the most horrible moment is also the greatest. Because as some people will be at home, this will allow many of us to have family time that we never give when we come home from work. From these two weeks, for some, you're going to get the closest you've ever had in the past decade. For some, you're going to be forced to be able to speak and to talk to your kids, not just tell them do your homework and go to bed. For many others, for many others, be, 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 be aware that some of us in this room will start businesses that we've just been dreaming about. This will be, for some of us, this will be your moment to do what you've been talking about. Do the very thing that your friend's tired of hearing. In these next two weeks, ain't got to be an idea no more. You've been saying, I need to put some things, I need to get some things in order. We have, we have people in this very room that can help you start your process. Some of you have been saying, I want to go through my closet and purge. We already have a medium for you to take out those things that you don't need and how we can get it into the hands of people who are getting ready to go to prom. We have solutions to cover every challenge that is in this room. I just don't even have time to even go through my credit report. I have someone that is, I have two people that is in this room that can systematically sit down with you, walk with you, and give you a strategy to repair your credit and your integrity on paper. No matter what it is, there's a solution in this room, in this room, in this room. But we have to function as one and move away from just saying, I'll pray for you. I'm going to keep it in prayer. No, I'm going to pray. What can I do? You have to interact and you have to open your mouth. You have to talk. So Paul says this, getting to Ephesians. I said I'd like to get to this. Ephesians 4.1. Paul says, I therefore prisoner of Christ. Take a look at it. Let's, uh, let's open up your Bibles again. Right? He says, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord. Number one, he is speaking of, as he's talking about, he's getting ready to push a point about walking in unity. That before we can do something effective in the world, there's some internal things that need to happen with us. That number one, I need to understand that one component that deals with me walking in unity as a corporate body, not just my internal family, but walking as a body of Christ, it has to have some constraints recognizing I am apprehended and detained by God. He came and he cuffed my life. I belong to him. I'm a prisoner of the Lord. I have been detained by him. My life was going in one direction. I was all over the place. I was scattered. I was double-minded. But God apprehended me in my life and constrained me and brought me under submission to who he is. I am a prisoner and therefore being constrained by him he says, I beseech you, meaning I beg, I am pleading with you that you walk worthy of the calling with which you are called. Number two, with this walking in unity, he's speaking of character. He's speaking of the character or the calling. He says, I'm begging you, I'm begging you, I'm pleading with you, please, please walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. Speaking of, this calling is speaking of your character. I'm begging you, I'm pleading with you. The calling on your life does not match the character by which you're walking in. Wow. And my prayer, and I'm pleading with you, is that you bring the level of your character up to match the level of your calling. There is a high calling on your life, but your character is not congruent with the call. And so I'm pleading with you to take your lifestyle very serious. I'm pleading with you to make an investment in character development. Build yourself up to match your calling. You've been giving a high level calling on your life. You are a royal priesthood. Not just the Halus, but you are as well. You are a royal priesthood, a royal holy nation. 
set aside to show forth the praises. You are, as scripture would say, Peter would say, a peculiar people, uniquely designed, fashioned by God to do a great work as imperfect people serving a perfect God. You have qualified for a calling that you would never qualify for because of his blood, because of his will, and because of his design. And he says, I am praying that I, I'm, be I'm begging you that you walk worthy of the reason why he created you. You're not walking on the level of your potential. God created you not just to take up space, not to just acquire a job and to create a lifestyle for yourself. He created you for his glory and for his purpose and for his will. And you're not living up to the reason by which he created you. The reason he puts breath in your body is because of your calling. The reason he gives you another day is because of purpose. And you're not living up to the purpose by which he gave you another day to live. And he says, I am begging you. Beseech means to plead earnestly, almost like pulling on you. I'm begging you to take your existence serious, that you redesign and adjust your life to fall in alignment to your calling. Which means I can't live casual and cavalier no more. He says, I'm, 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 I'm begging you. Because what he's not saying is this. He didn't have to create you. And if he created you, he was so purposeful when he made you. Don't be so self-centered and selfish and think that you created yourself. That life is about you. That you're so cavalier. That everything else is so important. If he doesn't give you that breath, that heartbeat, that pulse, it's gone. It's it. But he didn't create you to make a mistake. He created you for his glory and his purpose and destiny. And you're not living up to the reason of your existence. You're not. And he says, I'm begging with you that you walk worthy of the reason why you're here. And in thinking about that, you got a nerve to say, I don't want to be around other people. It's a privilege to experience life. You want to pick and choose who you want, other creation that he has made? You want to pick and choose who and what you want to be around? You're not even here on your own accord. You ain't choose when you was born, and you ain't going to choose when you die. He calls the shots. And while he is still giving you grace, and another day that you ain't earned, you need to reconsider your position. And I'm praying that you walk worthy. I'm praying that you will raise your level of character development to match the calling that is on your life. I'm begging you to get out of you. I am begging you to take yourself out of the picture and think about the reason why you exist. And it ain't because of you. It's because of him. You exist because of him. You're focusing on problems, people, places, and things. Ain't got nothing to do with you. It has all to do with purpose. And your life needs to come up to a level that matches your purpose. The, the third thing that he says here, first one was constraints, second one was your calling. The third one is, he talks about now the character of Christ. As you are raising up your character development, I want you to align your character to Christ. And he gives us a few areas to consider in terms of developing your character. Number one, he uses lowliness. As we're talking about the character of Christ, consider lowliness. As we're functioning together to move as one body, as one voice, functioning in unity with one another, in order for us to do that, you have to develop the characteristics of Christ in the area of lowliness. Lowliness. Lowliness is the freedom from pride. Lowliness is the freedom from pride or humility. It is when I want to be better than or bigger than who I am, I need to remind myself of the reality of the state of who I am. It's the freedom from pride. It's the freedom from pride. It's the freedom. It's lowliness. It's lowliness. It is the absence of pride. I need to stop thinking that I don't need nobody else because you do. Stop saying I can do bad by myself because you can't. You can't. You can't. And when pride comes in, it is a recipe for disaster. It is a recipe and a reser Write this down. It is a, res it is a reservation for a disaster. I can I get a table of one? Yes. 
the, the, the disaster section. Yes. <laughs> Table of one. It's a reservation and a recipe for disaster. So lowliness, he says, I want you to do this with all lowliness, which is the freedom from pride and humility. Then the second one that he gives, he says, and I want you to do this with gentleness. Gentleness is the sensitivity. Uh, it's the disposition of sensitivity. Um, to do it also in the area of kindness. Of kindness. Uh, operating when we're functioning in unity and I have to be around other people. I have to be sensitive that they're not like me. Hear me. So th the context is unity. But in order for me to become one unit as one, I have to be sensitive that everybody is not like me. Which requires for me to remove my pride in thinking that I am better than someone else and lowering the esteem that I keep thinking that I am just as sweet as butter, right? But I'm also doing it with gentleness. It is a disposition of sensitivity, which means that when I'm around people, I have to recognize that I'm always going to be in a center of a place or people that are always abrasive. There is always going to be one person in the group that is loud. There's somebody that's always in the group that is arrogant. I need to always recognize there's going to be somebody in the group that don't think like me, that is off the wall with the way the things that they say, the way that they do, and how they function. Just their body language, how they just move and do this, it's going to be abrasive. But I'm to function with the mindset of raising my character to develop like Christ which I do it in lowliness, freedom from pride, but also in gentleness, a sensitivity, in disposition, but to handle them with kindness. I need to be sensitive to this because when it comes to being sensitive, I got to recognize their past experience was not like mine. So when a person is loud, maybe they were like that because people never listened to them as a child. I had, a, I had a conversation with somebody one time. And I was like, why every time I'm talking to you, you feel like you got to cut me off? In joking, they say, well, this is how I grew up. We all had to get our words out, so we had to talk over one another to be heard. So you got to be sensitive to context. If they grew up fighting to be heard, then even in a gentle one-on-one -on -one conversation, they will cut your thoughts off. They'll shut you down because that was their context. So you have to learn... This is learned. Learn how to allow the Holy Spirit to teach you to be sensitive that they're not like me. They're different. But help me to harness what I am feeling by displaying kindness. Okay? And the way that I do that is by operating from the disposition when the sensitivity is exuded from me, it has to be pushed and ushered with grace. I have to give them something they don't qualify for. That's grace. You acting like that? I don't feel like being gentle with you right now. Because the, the flesh response, the flesh, the flesh response when I'm dealing with people in a context of unity is that, oh, you flex on me, I'm going to flex on you. But I'm going to flex a little harder so you will know. You will know I ain't the one to play with. That's not the character of Christ. Christ don't check people like that. There is nowhere in scripture where Christ says you're going to learn today. That's not in scripture. That's not biblical. Yeah, Michelle's. <laughs> huh? She's developing. She's developing. She's developing. Huh? Uh, it ain't just Michelle. Jazz will say it too. Felicia will say it too. I wish you would. They all say it. Yeah. Yeah. Roxanne will say, You two kinds of crazy. Not today. Like, I mean, everybody got something. You know what I mean? Everybody has to say something. Everybody has something that they will rebuttal to let the person know, I am not feeling sensitive to how, whatever you're thinking, what you, I, that has nothing to do with me, and you're not going to try that on me today. Right? But the character of Christ says, listen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to extend to you something that you don't deserve, another chance. Wow. Right? So it moves from lowliness, then he says gentleness. What is the third one? Take a look. This is one that y'all don't like. All right? Depending on your version, your version may say patience. King James is long-suffering. Long-suffering. Right? Long-suffering, as we talked about this before, this is this disposition. It is the outpouring of patience. It is the outpour of patience. It is the outpour of, clarify, sorry. It is the outpour of enduring patience that I extend towards people. 
People don't need patience. They need long suffering. We need, we need patience in situations, in circumstances. I don't need patience when I'm dealing with people. I need long suffering. And that is centered around dealing with difficult people that you can't move along in terms of a changed behavior or attitude. So long suffering, God allows certain people to be in my space that when they have an apprehension to change, it is my opportunity to exercise what has been lying dormant on the inside of me. And so I am to release and to show long suffering out of, out of the way of the work of the Holy Spirit. It is an outpour of patience to give endurant patience, right? Get this, that finds its base in mercy. And this is interesting. I give my long suffering from the basis of mercy. Which means, if this was in a court, if it was in a court, yes, you've been found guilty, but I am willing to put you on probation and or drop all of the charges because I'm extending to you the absence of a penalty. It's mercy. I'm giving you mercy because the way you're acting right now and the way that you keep me waiting, you keep saying you're going to do better, you keep saying you're going to change, and you keep doing the same old thing, you keep talking to me the same old way. Long suffering is, I'm going to give you another shot, even though you've proven to be guilty of this. I'm going to give you a season to correct yourself and to show that you have changed behavior by probation or dropping the charges. I'm going to give you mercy. I am not going to give you what should be hand, handed down to you as a sentence. That's mercy. So when we say, I need grace and mercy, God, I need you to give me what I don't deserve, but also keep back what I'm supposed to get. Mercy is holding back what that person is supposed to get. Long suffering. Long suffering. So when I go over time, long suffering, say, see, see how you roll your eyes right there? Huh? See how that? See that? Mm -hmm. right, yeah, right behind you, right over there. Right? Long suffering says, I'm going to act like I didn't see that. <laughs> long suffering says, she has an eyelash in her eye. Okay? I'm going to give her the benefit of the doubt. That at one moment or one point in time, eventually, she'll be excited for me to go beyond my time. Long-suffering says that maybe at some point she'll say, keep going. Don't stop. I want more. I want more. Right? That's long-suffering. We make it light of it, but this is the practical implications of it. That I give someone something that they don't qualify for. So unity is pushing me towards that. Not to mention that. He says later in this verse, bearing one another in love. We've got to hurry on. Bearing one another in love. Or another version says, forbearing one another. Mm, yeah, that's a hard one. Bearing with one another. It is operating in a place of enduring and suffering, giving you the benefit of the doubt, under the auspices, that even if you don't change, I'm going to treat you like you did. That one's hard, but it's the call to it. I'm going to treat you like you change even if you choose not to. I'm going to treat you like you don't have an attitude even though you do. I'm going to treat you like you no longer stank in attitude and that you're a joyful person even though you ain't changed a bit. That's for, forbearing one another, but the way that I forbear the foundation for that is forbearing other individuals, not with aim, but for love, in love. I do this in love. Because if I try to do this, you can't forbear somebody for an extended period of time in the absence of agape. Love, has the only, love is the only thing that can fill my tank to deal with that. Because when you're dealing with a person and you're trying your best to give them a concession to be different and they are unwilling to change, the call is not to cut them off. The call is for you to show compassion and to have forbearance. You don't see Christ cutting nobody off. We do that. We try to redefine what Christianity ought to look like. Somebody ain't, pfft, hmm. The Lord says, come out from among them. Yes, he did. Cut them off. You ain't got time for that. Where in Scripture does this, God say, Jesus with his disciples? No. You don't want to come, my child? Cut them off. Like, he doesn't do that. 
Like these principles that you are applying to your life are not biblical. But forbearance is. You don't want to change? Okay, well, I'll wait till you get to that place where you grow that to that. Because I still see value in you. Because I still see what you're not showing. Which is greatness. Yeah, you got an attitude right now, but on the other side of that anger, somewhere lies love. And the gentleness in me realize that the pain that you are experiencing right now didn't start with me. I'm on the back end of it. And I'm, I'm trying to learn. I'm trying to learn. This is hard. I'm trying to teach myself that when someone has an attitude and they, by the time they come to me and they're expressing it, I don't always get this, but I have to remind myself this didn't start with me. If they always got an attitude and everybody always telling them they got a mouth problem, somebody always telling me, I got to remind myself, they didn't just start with me. They're just releasing it on me. And I got to realize someone else put that there. But God has put me in a position that I'm supposed to patch up somebody else's wounds. That was inflicted by somebody else. And in our interaction, you just bled all over me. Now, I could cut you off and not deal with you, or I can be like a first responder and try to help you recover from some type, somebody else's uh, wound that they inflicted on you. That's developing the character of Christ. That when a person is not where you are, I don't cut them off because they haven't grown yet. I operate in long suffering and I wait for God to transform their life in his own time and his own way. I don't just trash people because they don't think like me, function like me, see like me, hear like me, sing like me, serve like me, give like me. I don't cut people off because they're not me. They are to be salvaged and saved and to be worked on and prayed for and encouraged. Everybody has something to value. Everybody else has something great on the inside of them. And because you're different from me, because your sin is different from me or because your hangups are different from me, you don't need to be around me. That is not the character of Christ. I am to love them where they are. And then lastly, let's jump to the end. I'm a, I have to, this requires for me to make adjustments. The last point, it requires for me to make adjustments. For me to function as one body in Christ, I have to make some adjustments. It, number one, requires adjustments in my agenda. I got to realize that I'm not even on my own schedule. I'm on God's schedule. I have to change my agenda, which means even if I'm pressed for time, I have to make some concessions to say somebody's life is just as important as mine. Somebody else's hunger is just as important as mine. Somebody else's time is just as important as mine. My, my, my clock ain't the only one that's important. Somebody else's, no offense, Keanu. Everybody else's clock is important too. Right? And so I need to come into a place where I says, listen, I have to make the adjustment, which means I have to repivot. I'm sorry. They hate when I say this. I have to reposition, right, my stance on agenda. I don't have one. I'm on God's time. I'm on God's time. I'm on God's time. And he has to come first, and he dictates the agenda for my life. The second one was this. Attitude. I need to make adjustments when I'm dealing with people in my attitude. It is the methodical process of how I view and see people. Because how I view, how I see people, my perspective dictates what I'm going to say and what I do next. If my attitude is not checked, then you'll know it in my actions. If my attitude is not checked, it's going to come out in my actions. So I got to be willing to not only make an, uh, an adjustment in my agenda, but also in my attitude. And then lastly, I need to make an adjustment in my actions, meaning my conduct and my conversations. In my conduct and in my conversations. I need to make an adjustment in my conduct, what I do and what I say. What I do and what I say. There needs to be an adjustment to that. Because I can't have unity if my conduct is showing signs that I want to be divisible or to spawn division. My conversations, the things that I say, needs to entertain towards unity. Let me say this. Universally, we have a bad habit 
that even in the even in the appearance of portraying a righteous motive we can still be cancerous and dividing like please pray for please please pray for me please pray for me you would say what if I say please pray for me why Look, I ain't gonna. I can't say what it is, but all I'ma say is, if I gotta deal with a laundry one more time, just pray. I'm masking righteousness with the seed of division. So now, so now, you're expecting her to operate in righteousness, but you just sowed a seed of discord. Because now, in her mind, the prayer focus is not about praying from my heart her attention now is what did Alondria do that is unspoken which leaves room for speculation and gossip gossip is like the sweet tea of Satan everybody want to sip and this happens so much in the body of Christ it is ridiculous The world's greatest evangelists, hear me, are gossipers who haven't grown. Because they don't mind sharing news, just not the good news. So a gossiper can never tell me, I don't like being in front of people. I don't like, I don't, I don't, that's not me. I don't like to, I can't talk about Christ, but you can talk about gossip. You pick and choose what you want to share. You can share the good news or you want to share scandal. But when it comes to going out and doing evangelism, I don't know if I can share my faith, but you can share somebody else's mess. Ain't that crazy? Why is it that we know more negative things about people in this church than the positive? Some people in here can probably tell you three negative things about you, but hardly can't say one thing. I asked my child in the back, he was in the back seat just the other day. I said, look at your brother. He was in the back seat. I, didn't, I couldn't even see him. I said, look at your brother. Look at your brother. Say one nice thing about him. Uh, I like how your gums look since your teeth are missing. That's what I said. I was like, do it again. I don't, I don't know what to say nice about him. It's the nature of who we are. He's going to develop into a man, unless I help him to break that pattern. He's going to develop into a man where he can't say nothing nice. I'm like, that's your brother. I said, Amari, say something nice about your brother. Uh, 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 he went on. What did he say? It was something like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, you, you got big teeth. I like how you chew. Something like that. Something about his teeth. So then I said, then I said, um, TJ, say something back to him. And you know what he said? Now, I'm, I'm pushing him to come outside of himself. I'm trying to train him to see something great in somebody else and, and identify it. Let's talk about it. Yeah. Dad, why are you doing this? Why do I got to say something nice about him? And he getting an attitude. Why do I got to say something nice about him? Same context. We, we mature into adults. Speak well over people who are in your space. Encourage them. Why well, pastor always tell we gotta hug somebody? Why we gotta have fellowship? Come on, man, don't we gotta do all that? Why we can't just come sing and leave? Why is it important for me to speak to my why well, I gotta say something to my all the time? I don't have to talk. I don't have to do all that. And it's those things that keep us from being unified. These fingers are on the same hand, but they're not unified until they come together. I can't celebrate the fact that I'm just on the same hand. I got to work towards being together. So I want to give you permission, because it's our responsibility to protect the unity of our atmosphere. Push people to be better. Push people to be better. 
Push people to be better. Push people to be better. When there is negative conversation, you need to shut it down. Hey, did you did you hear what? Why would they do? What you go ask them? I'm not. I wasn't even there. Why you? Why you? Why you asking me? I wasn't even there. Why? Why pastor guy do like? Here's an idea. Won't you ask pastor? Then you ain't getting wrong information. You can get it right from him. I don't know why they do all that. Won't you go ask him? No, I ain't, I ain't gonna say nothing. But then why you saying it to me? Some stuff we don't have to chase the enemy away from. Some stuff we just got to stop being used by him. And some of y'all just be volunteering to be reserves for the kingdom of darkness. We get enough people tearing us down on the outside. We all we got. We're all we got. In a world that don't love God, the believers we're all we got. And you are here and I'm here to be in each other's life so that we can make sure that we bring glory to God and that we have each other's back. My commitment today and my invitation for you today is to have one another's back. Not just by distant praying, but being together as one saying, what can I do? 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 Let's, let's pray.